Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Godfrey, and I'm the director of Bonington Gallery at Nottingham Trent University. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event and in conversation between our current exhibitor, Onieka Igwe, and Dr. Jenny Ramone, Associate Professor of Postcolonial and Global Literatures at NTU. This is happening on the occasion of Onieka's uh, incredible solo exhibition, History is a Living Weapon in Your Hand, currently on view in the gallery until March the 2nd. Tonight's event will explore some of the core aspects of Onieka's practice, a current exhibition and the film that is central to it entitled A Radical Duet, made last year. The plan is for Jenny and Onyeka to be in conversation for around 50 minutes, followed by a Q&A, which I hope very much you will be able to contribute to. You can do this in two ways, either drop a question or comment in the live chat or email us at bonningtongallery at ntu.ac.uk and we'll also drop those details in the chat. Before handing over, I'm very happy to introduce both speakers. Jenny Ramone is Associate Professor of Postcolonial and Global Literatures at NTU, where she directs the Postcolonial and Global Studies Research Group. She is also Managing Editor of the Journal of Postcolonial Writing. Her forthcoming book is Global Literature and Gender, 21st Century Perspectives, and recent books include Postcolonial Literatures in the Local Literary Marketplace, Located Reading, and at the Bloomsbury Introduction to Postcolonial Writing. Her current project is based on breastfeeding in literature and art. Onieka Igwe is a London-born and based moving image artist and researcher. Her work is aimed at the question, how do we live together? Not to provide a rigid answer as such, but to pull apart the nuances of mutuality, coexistence and multiplicity. Onieka's practice figures sensorial, spatial and counter-hegemonic ways of knowing are central to that task. For her, the body, archives and narratives, both oral and textual, act as a mode of inquiry that makes possible the exposition of overlooked histories. She has had solo and duo exhibitions at MoMA PS1 in New York, The High Line in New York, Mercer Union Toronto, Gerard Arts in London, and Trinity Square Video in London. Her films have been screened in new, numerous group exhibitions and film festivals worldwide. Currently, she is practitioner in residence at the University of the Arts London, and she will participate in the group show Nigeria Imaginary in the National Pavilion of Nigeria at the upcoming 60th Venice Biennial. She was awarded the New Cinema Award at Berwick Film and Media Arts Festival in 2019, 2020 Arts Foundation Fellowship, and in 2021, the Foundwork Artist Prize. She's also been nominated for the 2022 Jarwood Jarman Award and the Max Mara Artist Prize for Women. So without much further ado, I'm very happy to pass over to Jenny and Onyeka. Hello everyone, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's Formations event. I'm here in conversation with artist Onyeka Igwe, who is an artist who works across film, visual image, installation and writing. And she's also a researcher, which is evident from her arts, which often draws on archival materials. And we'll be talking about that tonight. Her work includes essay videos, short films, visual imagery and text. And some of the recurring references in her work are to archives, dance and physical movement, colonial history, radical history, women's lives and social change. Onyeka's work is global in scope. Her film and visual work has addressed the concept of national identity. It's addressed what's forbidden by prison regulations in a project on letters undertaken with a Canadian correctional facility. It's addressed Nigerian history in a series of works on the Abba Women's War of 1929 and visual trauma. It's addressed personal history with both We Need New Names and The Names Have Changed, films which deal with the funeral of the artist's grandmother and the life stories of her grandfather. Both films also representing Nigerian stories and popular culture. 
It's also local. The miracle on George Green brings together the global history of radical responses to challenges to collective land use, the history of the UK commons and the story of a sweet chestnut tree in East London. I hope that we'll have time to discuss some of Onyeka Igwe's back catalogue of work, or at least her inspirations and her developing practice tonight. But it might be that we don't have time to do a lot of that because there's so much to talk about in relation to History is a Living Weapon in Your Hand, the installation currently exhibited at NTU's Bonington Gallery, which expands on her film, A Radical Duet. Onyeka, welcome to Formations. It's wonderful to have you and your work as part of our programme. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to hear more about a radical duet, history is a living weapon in your hand, and about your work as an artist. And I wondered whether you could begin by talking about a radical duet, the film, and then we can move on to discuss history as a living weapon in your hand, the installation or exhibition that builds on your film. So perhaps you'd like to introduce a radical duet, first of all, in case any of our audience members are unfamiliar with it, perhaps by describing your your concept for the film or what you wanted to achieve. Mm, yeah, thank you so much, Jenny. That was a really uh, comprehensive introduction to my work. I was like, oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, um, so a radical duet came about because I was interested in kind of speculating uh, around the historical moment. I had been interested in researching some figures from the 1940s and 1947 kind of kept on recurring and seemed to be this important um, year for the figures that I was looking into. And the kind of people that I was interested in were people like Fimalea Ransom Kuti, George Padmore, CLR James, um, Catherine Dunham, Una Marson, Amy Ashwood Garvey and Sylvia Winter. And they seem to all have been around in London around 1947, but doing different things in terms of their kind of, whether it would be politics or writing or dancing or theatre or studying, um, but they were also re really invested in anti-colonial politics. And so I just thought I wanted to kind of imagine and speculate what would have happened if they or people like them did meet, what they would have used the kind of energy and fervor and imagination for the future. Because at that moment, they were thinking about uh, a, a world ending a certain kind of world order ending and in that they had a lot of ideas about what could come next what was the potential and for me I'd been making these films around the history of colonialism and I had this question of what comes next what comes next when there's this like social huge societal rupture this like failure this like massive violence what comes after that? And I wondered if these people who were thinking about that question could help me um, think about that for, for today and for the present. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned lots of people there, lots of really um, inspirational, radical figures from that period. But I wonder how you made your choice of the kinds of figures who you'd represent and the kind of interaction that they would have. Was there a specific archive visit or a specific item that inspired you to write a radical duet? Um, I think that I, it was maybe like images that I, there was maybe mm -hmm. two images in particular that made me think about centering the story on women um I mean more generally I knew a lot about these figures the male figures I think that they have a place in in the kind of hit British history um if you're slightly interested in these issues you probably heard of them I'm sure people have heard about CLR James he comes up in lots of different ways but um I hadn't the women weren't so kind of accessible so I already was interested in that, in how politics and history can be gendered and who gets kind of left out of uh, certain stories. But I think there's 
an image of Familia Ransom Kuti wearing this amazing wrapper when she's got like elephant print on it. And she's like walking, it's like a, a newspaper clipping and she's like walking through London. And I don't know, there's something about how she was dressed, um, how she was walking that I, and like thinking about how old she was, she was in like her mid forties. Um, and kind of imagining like what, she had already done the kind of politics that she'd been involved in in Nigeria, the kind of things that she'd experienced and how she would bring that into how she would engage in this. You know, she came to London in 1947 to petition for independence. And then there's this amazing image of Sylvia Winter in this beautiful dress, kind of like dancing. Um, And that made me think about... This is from a bit later, probably in the 50s. But that made me think about what... I mean, you said that, like, dance and movement is something that I come back to. And I think about how that is a mode of communication, but also, like, a mode of thinking through ideas. And so I was like, OK, what does it mean that someone who had this has this maybe traditional oratory mode of pol- politics and someone who's, like, uh, enmeshed in this world of performance and dance, how do they relate to the same thing? So I think it's those two images that kind of created the the dynamic that I wrote around for the film. Mm. I think it's so fascinating that there are two women as well, um, that you have this, this meeting, I suppose, ordinarily when people uh, reclaim archives or figures from history and think about the way that history has been constructed in a similar way to what you're doing they might focus on one figure but having two figures who have quite different ideas as is shown in the film they have quite different approaches and they they kind of argue at the beginning and they 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 want to do things differently um I think it really is very powerful to have them operating together and working together despite their obviously different approaches did you did you feel like having two women rather than simply having one woman to kind of correct the the gendered history but having two women working together was essential for what you were doing I think that I thought well I was I think I was interested in this idea of intergenerational exchange I mean a lot of it is like fantasy not that these things didn't happen like of course people came together across many different um backgrounds experiences different tactics and strategies and like any political movement is made up of many different approaches so yes there is a kind of reality or like a a fact to this but also it's kind of a fantasy in a way like um I kind of have said that in some way I wanted to like spend time in this moment to help me in the present so and for me personally I I'm I feel like um, a lack sometimes of like intergenerational exchange Mm. that there's like something missing between of how we communicate what's happened and that creates a kind of circularity like kind of doomed to repeat the same things over and over again Mm. so I think with Sylvie and Adura I was like it was a fantasy of like intergenerational kind of uh, exchange and how you can learn from each other not that like the young people or the right people or whatever it's more like oh what are there's differences but there's some way that those differences can exist and be present and also uh be part of what people make together mm. part of what the the film conveys is this question about the value of art the value of literature um sylvie st hill says we need stories and she proposes writing a play as a method of collective organization for the time when colonized people will have control over themselves um and this is something that some of the other people um reject some of the the male uh, members of that activist group reject that and say um i'm not wasting my precious time writing a play we've got better things to do kind of thing um do you think part of what you're doing is uh, kind of recuperating the arts or is it the the stage, the drama, um, the play that that you think is a, a place where change can happen? I think that what I was researching when I was like looking into these figures is that the type of activity that women did was 
was diverse. It wasn't mm-hmm. only being part of political groups or writing books or helping finance political organisations in a very kind of conventional sense. They were also um, writing plays, being part of dance troupes, uh, like someone like Catherine Dunham, you know, was using like was trying to communicate political ideas through the dances that she was chore- choreographing and performing. And you know, they were writing poems, commissioning stories. So, and also they were like um, someone like Amy Ashford Garvey was like hu- like being a social um, kind of fixture and creating spaces for people to meet and. It just felt to me that these things are valued less because we know less about them than we do about people who have left, um, I don't know, chunky theoretical books behind or yeah. like, multiple speeches. Yeah. So mm. I, I was in, I'm not, I don't have anything, I don't have a definitive thing to say about what art can do <laughs> or what its potential is. Yeah. more what I'm interested in communicating is the possibility of multiplicity is that there's mm. a more than one route to something and mm. I want yeah I want to com- I want to share that the possibility that alongside all the things that we think of as political action there are also other things that can be political action as well yeah yeah that's really interesting thank you um, I wondered whether a radical duet was the first time that you've worked with actors. I'm not sure, I might be wrong, but I think your previous films have been created using original materials and archival materials, but haven't involved you directly directing actors. Am I right? And if that's right, I wondered if you could talk about how you found the process of mm. working with actors. I have worked with voice actors before, but Mm. this was the first time it was both voice and body. (laughs) Um, It was definitely a new experience for me. And it was, yeah, it was like maybe the first time I'd written a whole script as well. So both of those two things in terms of like screenplays and directing actors were like very, very new experiences. And I mean, it was a a challenge and I I worked with... um, I did like a, a screenwriting course and was working, um, I worked with like a, a really great writer called Yara Rodriguez Fowler who helped me with like thinking about dialogue. That was the thing that I was like most concerned about. Like, how do I do this dialogue? How do I, you know, when you watch films, sometimes you feel like that's the really clunky thing. That's something that you can really easily grab onto. So I was quite concerned about that. In terms of working with actors, it was like a very exciting process. I feel like the experience of hearing words that you've written suddenly come alive in a person is yeah it's really quite magical actually um and I was quite shy at first (laughs) and didn't really want to like um you know I didn't want to make them repeat and do like several takes and then I got I kind of grew into it and found ways to talk it's like how do you talk to people I think a lot about filmmaking is like how do you communicate your ideas to this large group of people who have different roles within it. So it was trying to figure out how these characters are in my head in some way, like I can imagine them. I know what's right and what's not. So how do I actually use words? (laughs) Well, not even necessarily use words, but how do I find a language to communicate that to the actors? Yeah, yeah. Did you do the casting as well? How did you find the, the right actors to play the part? Yeah, so um, I did I did like a, a script read through um, initially um, um, a few months before, a quite a, like a as a way of checking in about the script, having an audience to see if it was working, and there I just kind of like looked online very briefly and like posted it and got some uh, responses, and two of the actors that participated in that ended up being part of the of the final cast. And then I worked with a casting director to help find the other the other actors. So, yeah, it was like lots of times listening to people read the script, perform the script. And this I like trying to get out like this, trying to recognize if what I heard in my head was coming out (laughs) from people's like kind of performances. Yeah, yeah. 
it was fascinating watching the second part of the film, um, which is a, a kind of um, like a, a, a workshopping, reading through and engaging with archival materials film. And it was really interesting to see the way the actors engage with the materials. And it felt like from a from a kind of observer's perspective that the actors were, were all quite different in personality um, and some had a lot to say about those archival materials and were quite kind of dominant voices and others were um, much more kind of um, uh, passive and polite. I wondered whether that's a, a direct representation of what was happening or whether that was also a scripted, constructed part of the film. So were the actors kind of told to be themselves there or was that also, you know, a, a, a construction? Hmm. No, I wanted it to be quite separate in thinking about what performance is. Um, so I wanted the first part to even be in some way like overperformed to feel quite theatrical um, and for the second part to be documentary. Mm. So they didn't have that much information. I mean, they knew broadly what I was interested in, the kind of roots of and the background to the to the film, but I hadn't shown them all that material. Um, and anytime they kind of said something, I was just like, oh, just like save it for <laughs> save it for <laughs> that shoot. So it, it wasn't at all directed. I never kind of asked them to behave more in one way than the other. Um, mm -hmm. It was all their own kind of personalities. And that's what I was interested also mm -hmm. in the audience kind of engaging with the fact that this, these thing, these people that we, hadn't seen before that we just met in watching this film that we kind of in some way believe to be these people that they represent are actually these other people and mm -hmm. so and they approach the they're approaching the kind of history the archive the situation in the same way that the audience could be approaching mm -hmm. it yeah although some of them seem to have a lot of information and memories that they brought to that as well, which also added a further kind of layer of, of a different kind of knowledge and more multiple voices to the, to the project as well. It's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I think also the, the intergenerationality, I should say, of the cast also kind mm. of enabled that because people had more closer relationships to this history than others and I think mm. that kind of played out and yeah I didn't like cast people asking them what's your personal connection to these stories mm. they just ended up having them which I think mm. is something to say about what's kind of like latent in um in communities that there's already this kind of information there but maybe people aren't asking the questions yeah I noticed that both parts of the film, A Radical Duet, begin with images of several doorways, homes and houses. Um, this notion or this kind of concept of homes, houses, hostels, flats, shared rooms, living quarters is kind of a, a really central theme in literary representations of post-Windrush mm. um, Caribbean and African migration to Britain and in scholarly work on the period as well. And I'd love to hear more about why you decided to foreground kind of doorways, doors, homes, dwelling places um, so prominently, or at least it felt very prominent to me. Um, and then maybe even more about the process of choosing specific doors and houses, locating them and filming them as well. Yeah. I think one thing that I was doing when I was, re like the film is also in some ways very much about a kind of London history. I live in London and the, uh, for me, some I was, I remember I was in the British Library and I was looking up something about George Padmore and I found out that he, there was a blue plaque, he lived very close to the British Library. So I just like went on my bike after being there and just like kind of went along and was like, huh, this is where he used to live. Mm. And, you know, this was like, he lived in there, I think in the 30s. So like 90 years ago or something, this is where he used to live. And it still remains. And I think that kind of notion that, under our noses in some way these places still exist and there's something about like how um memory and history 
in Britain is um, rendered, how it can be like in the walls in some way, but it's continually reused, like buildings continually reused. Like I made a, a film called A Circled Archive. It was very much about thinking about how architecture functions in the UK and that there's like multiple layers of what it originally was that you can forget what it was before. And so, yeah, I became interested in that, in like going through the city and thinking about things that are still there and that that 90 years ago, some of the kind of like fixtures and like cornices and like parts of the buildings would have been exactly the same. It kind of like allows you to, allows me to kind of put myself in proximity to these people so that's what I was interested in doing and I think I wanted to film it um on 16 millimeter because I felt like it was because of I wanted to create this kind of like um uh, the time uh, the film is in many ways about like multiple times there's the 1947 there's a the present but I wanted this idea of like things that remain in some way kind of indelible in the cityscape to have a kind of not really have a definitive time and it felt like 16 millimeter was the best way to kind of mm. convey that and mm. it was really fun shooting that I did it with a friend of mine called Matty we shot it together and we also like uh processed it at my flat some of the some of the films so it was this very kind of yeah we had like an intimate relationship I think you shooting on film is very different for me anyway than like the the digital shooting like that was like a big crew lots of people but suddenly it was a small intimate thing we were just like cycling around London filming places people were just like talking to us there was this guy who was outside Kwame and Krumah's he lived opposite Kwame and Kruma's house. He was like shouting at us from the window, asking us what we were doing. People would come out of the Af- of the former Africa house and ask us what we were doing and be like, oh yeah, we heard about this. So like, it was a much different kind of um, experience. And then, yeah, it's, it's a more intimate kind of, I don't know how to, how else to describe it, but yeah, it was like important for me to have that in the film as well. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's fascinating to hear that because it's not obvious from watching the film that it was filmed so differently. It looks different, of course, but without the knowledge of how you undertook the process, um, you know, your audience wouldn't have that information. So it's so fascinating to hear about that process. Um, How about choosing specific houses and, and locations? There must have been quite a lot that you could choose. Did you did you think about how they actually looked and having a um a kind of a a match a kind of graphic match from house to house or did you think about choosing different kinds of places or whether particular people or locations that you insisted on including I think another thing that I wanted to highlight was that most of the men that I was researching had blue plaques Mm. and not at that time when I started making the film I don't think really any of the women did Subsequently, Una Marson has a blue plaque, I think, and Amy Ashwood Garvey most recently has one. So I was interested in this lack. So I just I wanted to get all of the blue plaques that related to these key like uh, black figures in the anti-colonial movement in that time. So mm-hmm. it's Kwame Nkrumah, CLR James, George Padmore, Paul Robeson. Um, and then I also wanted to try and find out where um, some some of the women also who I was interested in. So it's Sylvia Winter's house and Fumalea went Ransom Kuti's two of her different lo- lodgings. So mm-hmm. I didn't actually think so much about them aesthetically. Oh, and also, sorry, Africa House as well. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about them aesthetically. I mean, they all have a kind of similarity in many mm. ways. They're kind of like Georgian houses, basically. Um, Georgian or Victorian houses. And I was interested in thinking about, like, details, like looking at um, how things were, like, finished and lights and things like that. But I wasn't necessarily... That was once 
not to choose the house but like once I was like filming the house that was the things that I was like looking for mm-hmm. like elements that I think would um have remained in all this time that wouldn't really have changed yeah yeah this seems a good moment to bring up your blue plaques um project as well so in the Bonington Gallery exhibition um, visitors can also see a related exhibition of some of your work um, in the vitrines area which includes images of blue plaques of the kind that we see on those houses that you were talking about. Um, Could you tell us more about your blue plaques project? Yeah as I said it was more like thinking there's a very kind of gendered stark divide here about who gets remembered Um, and when I was starting the project most of the women that I was looking to didn't have any um and I so I was just like it's a you know the film is very much engaging in speculation and imagination so it felt apt to like also imagine blue plaques for all these figures uh that I was interested in so it's yeah this kind of renderings of blue plaques on the buildings that these uh women would have lived in or been associated with and then in in the vitrines themselves it's lots of kind of like archival material relating to the research that I had done so newspaper clippings photographs uh playbills uh poems things like that Mm. the so the installation at Bonington Gallery is a new work it is a radical duet but it's also a kind of restaging reconstruction of that film across two screens in a gallery with lots of objects as well could you talk about why you decided to create the installation um it it could have perhaps just been a screening of your film but you've decided to create something new with your film it'd be lovely to hear more about your thought process behind that Mm. Yeah, I mean, when I think of working in a gallery space, I think that cinemas are really, really good places to watch films. They're comfortable, they're dark, um, and all your concentration is headed towards the screen. And I think the a gallery is never going to be good as a cinema. So if it's going to show in a gallery, I want it to do something different. And what's different about a gallery is that it's a space that people can move through. And so I want to encourage some kind of movement. And the film has these, has like two distinct time movements. And like, it's some way split in half. When I was editing it, I was imagining that there was this midpoint in the film that kind of comes in pretty much around 14 minutes where suddenly we move into a different time. And so it felt like this is a a perfect way to split the screen, uh, to split the film into two screens and that people have to kind of like pass through uh, the past into the present and they have to physically move through. They have to get off up from the seat. They're looking at one screen and move through into the other. Um, And so that was kind of the a big impetus. And I also I was really from the beginning when I was even making the film wanted to bring out some of the props, some of the elements that you see on screen out into the gallery space um, and kind of mess with this, um, again, with ideas of like fantasy and speculation and imagination, like kind of press an audience to engage again with the ways in which we can passively like watch and encounter and experience stories could I like press them to kind of rethink about what they had just seen Mm. yeah lovely it's really interesting um and it is it's really interesting to be in that space and to be with those objects that you've just seen on the screen and as you say to have to physically move around that space um the exhibition title is history is a living weapon in your hand and I wondered if you could tell us how you decided on the title and why it's so different from the film's title. Mm. I, titles are always very difficult um, (laughs) for me. And I basically had asked, I I had been part of this kind of reading group that is kind of now defunct, but we still have like a little like group chat. And I was like, 
said to people, this is my film, this is what it's about, can you help me? <laughs> like, find a title for the film. And um, we, like, eventually kind of, like, ended up on a radical duet. But in that title, someone, uh, a friend, Sarah Shin, had posted uh, this Diane de Prima poem. Um, not a rev- not one of the revolutionary um, letters, but another poem. And uh, I just really, really stuck, the line, history is a living, living weapon in your hand, really stuck with me. Because it, that, the kind of active engagement that we can have with history, the idea that also it can be a weapon, a tool, a way, um, in act, in like kind of activating change was also like felt like very important and so yeah that title kind of just like remained in the back of my mind as something that I wanted to revisit so when thinking about naming the exhibition I knew that I wanted it to be distinct from the film because the exhibition is not the film it's something different it's something more um and that kind of activeness of the title um felt appropriate for what I was trying to do with the exhibition Mm. it also seems to put the impetus in the audience's hands um to do something with what they've what they've just seen what they've just witnessed what they've just been asked to think about um so to enact the audience as well I wondered if that's what you think is happening I mean, you know, dream scenario is that people can... I wanted to reside in this period to activate me, to help me enact some things. And so I definitely want an audience to do do that as well. Um, And, yeah, it's good to hear that the the, the title kind of points to that kind of a thing. You have a very strong sense of engaging with your audience and part of what you've done to make this exhibition as accessible as possible to as many potential audience members as possible is working with an organisation called Collective Text. Um, I'd love to hear more about how you got in touch with them and about their work and why you decided to engage them to help you to construct this um, Mm. exhibition in collaboration. I started working with Collective Text in 2020. Um, I was working on another film called A So-Called Archive and I had watched this um, this video from a, a deaf artist called Christine Sun Kim about the kind of abject um, failure of a lot of captioning mm. in a uh, moving image. And I'd never really thought about it before. And suddenly I realised that I had made like absolutely no effort towards my films being accessible to um, to deaf and hard of hearing audiences. And at the same time, collective text were, there was a kind of a sample or like a showcase, I should say, of their work on Lux. And so I learned about them and the work that they'd done they were doing primarily working with artists moving image and that was the kind of thought that I had it's like okay how do I make captions or how do I make work, my work accessible when I'm thinking about sound in particular ways in like layered ways in opaque ways how is that possible so hearing about an organization that kind of like specialized in thinking about in thinking about captions in a in a kind of more complex way than for example the type of captions that I had traditionally like engaged with on television uh felt really like exciting so Mm -hmm. we work together and when I say that and I'm talking a lot about like captions and deaf audiences I hadn't even considered visually impaired and blind audiences when I had thought about this so then I learned through working with them they all tell uh, I learned about audio description and accessibility options for um for visually impaired audiences so it was a big learning process and with a so-called archive it felt like I hadn't I'd only scratched the surface and I hadn't quite really engaged to the full to a fuller extent and so when I was like um trying to get funding for this project uh, for Radical Duet, it felt important to think about that really early on. And so I got in touch with them again and we started working also on the film. 
And then I mentioned to them it was going to be an exhibition and they said, oh, you know, have you thought about how we can bring the things that we're doing for the film into the exhibition? And once again, I hadn't hadn't occurred to me. So it was, you know, it was like I working with Tom and Bonington to try and like at a quite late stage incorporate a lot of the things from the film into the exhibition um has been like a real once again a, a massive eye opener and a work a real work in progress and like uh I think I am learning uh, all the time and I, I think yeah, I'm learning from um, Collective Tech's work also with a lot of cons uh, consultants who, um, yeah, from those kind of communities who are deaf or who are visually, have visual impairments um, to to kind of bridge the gaps um, and fill the spaces of, of knowledge. So, yeah, I've learned a lot and... That and hopefully, like, it's stuff that I can carry through to further projects and I'm sure and develop on. And I'm sure there's still more to learn, but it's quite exciting for this exhibition that there is um, audio description that people can access. The films are captioned, parts of um, the, the kind of exhibition choreograph choreography are also kind of audio described and some are captioned and also in a couple of weeks we're doing like um, a lunchtime walkthrough that will incorporate a touch tour so people can actually like touch um, parts of the props and things like that that they don't usually get to do um, and we can kind of talk a bit more about the process and engage more um, about how accessibility has been considered for the project. Mm. Yeah, it's seeing it kind of in action um, in the gallery. It feels like it's doing something really important. It's asking people to think differently about how exhibitions are put together. It does more than just kind of um, um, allow people to access the same thing. It it allows the, the exhibition itself to grow in new directions and add new levels and layers of meaning to an existing exhibition. It feels like it's something that is really going to inspire um, other artists to do the same with their exhibitions as well. I mean, I think for sure, like, for me, like, it helped this doing the, doing like integrated captions and audio description helps me uh, yeah, kind of understand in many ways what it is, or like help, like yeah, brings a new level of understanding to what the work is doing. Um, mm. It's not the same thing. It's not. It's a different thing. It's a different kind of vernacular. Um, and I yeah do agree that I think that enriches uh, mm. exhibition. Mm. But you often mention um, Brecht and Sylvia Winter as inspiration for your um, artistic work, your practice and your creative output. I wonder if you wanted to talk about either of those or both of those figures and why they've been so inspiring for your work. Hmm. I mean, I have to say that I am really not in any way like a theatre <laughs> scholar <laughs> or a aficionado. And my knowledge of Brecht is actually quite small but it's more through it's like Brecht through Sylvia Winter she's mm. very much working with Brechtian ideas um and kind of using her particular location as a trying to engage with a Jamaican indigenous theatre that um would respond to Jamaican conditions and Jamaican experiences but in the kind of um, in the scaffolding of Brecht, I would say, yeah, um, yeah. is how I kind of accessed his ideas. Mm. She um, in a kind of she does this translation uh, of um, a Lorca play, uh, the House of Bernarda Alba, and in that play she talks about Brechtian ideas of epic theatre and this desire for theatre to not remain in this like fantastical otherworldly space for it to be kind of dragged into the lives of the people who are watching it 
And yeah, Brett has the, the ways in which like he is like thinking about doing that, and she kind of adapts that in some ways. And she, the whole mm-hmm. point of the translation is like translating Lorca, this text that's set in a particular place in a particular time, to Jamaica, this different place, and using these Brechtian ideas around the set and set design to um, kind of uh, she talks about exploding. Um, uh the reality uh for the audience mm. and so it was that that I was thinking about when um I was imagining the exhibition it's like how can we uh kind of diminish this this the fantasy of film the fantasy of like oh we're in a period setting it's 1947 they're wearing all these clothes that this is Clive's living room like, how can we disturb that in some way by bringing Clive's living room into the exhibition space? Um, and, you know, like, by having scripts on the office table, by, like, showing the working out, showing the behind the scenes um, and seeing what that does, does that allow people to place themselves in this history a bit easier if it doesn't seem in a completely other world, if it actually seems closer to them? Mm-hmm. So yeah, those were kind of some of the things, but also I guess I was thinking about um, other ways in which people have used Brecht as well, Uh, like Lars von Trier with Dogville and the markings on the kind of huge soundstage is kind of incorporated in the exhibition with the like markings um, on the gallery floor and like the names of different rooms. So so yeah, like I would say, really engaging with Brecht without <laughs> reading that much Brecht. <laughs> yeah well as from my knowledge I think that's what he hoped people would do with his with work. He, I think his theory was a, a kind of movable theory that could be transported into the contemporary political situation as required and um, I think that's what your your work does um, really really effectively. Um, I wondered if you could talk about how this exhibition fits in with your other work. Um, You've often worked with archival materials and I wonder whether this is something um, that is central to what you do or whether you have other things to say about how this work engages with or or builds on your previous work. I mean I think I yeah made a lot of films specifically around colonial archives for a long time and in this kind of very hilarious stubborn way I was like I'm not making any more our films about archives after a film in 2020 and then the first thing I did after that was make a film about archives, <laughs> or like using archives in some way and you know I think there's a, a way in which my practice is a, thinking about political and his questions through history um and that just seems to be like uh, an inclination that it's hard for me to shake in some way um I like history was my favorite subject when I was at school so I think I just that's kind of how I think about the world is like I'm curious about what has happened before in the past um so but I think I in the films that I made they previously was a lot of kind of um re-representation of archival images Mm. and I've tried to move away from that and I've been more interested in um in thinking through fiction in thinking through speculation and if the question in some way if if the limitation felt like with, with engaging with archives is that they don't tell the whole story or they miss things out there's gaps they tell the story of those in power um if that um is what I was uncovering and working in that way how could other stories be told and so mm-hmm. the idea of thinking about speculation may is inspired by you know thinkers like Sadia Hartman and the idea of critical fabulation um it's like providing this other space that that to imagine into. 
as a, a final question from me, um, perhaps you could talk about what's next for this film. Um, you have an event about the film on March the 10th in Berwick, which looks like another really exciting and very different way to engage with a radical duet, a real departure from the current installation at Bonington. I wondered if you wanted to talk about that and any other plans that you have for a radical duet, which are perhaps equally um, experimental. I mean, I'm uh, like, yes, um, at Berwick, there's going to be a screening of the film and then um, a live reading of um, one of Winter's plays, one of the plays that features in the film. Um, and I think that I, the film's also screening in like festivals and single, like next week it's screening at the Africa Centre here in London. So it's like, important for me to try and like get it into like different audiences I'd really love to screen it in um on the continent or in the Caribbean so to actually kind of see what people different people people who have a closer rea- relation or a different relationship to this history um perhaps would respond to it and like I think you said the audiences are quite important and I think for me the reason why I make work is for like conversation and dialogue is to learn from it and so it's quite important to um to test that out in different environments um but ultimately a radical duet is the first third of like a feature script so i am trying to work on getting funding to make that feature version where actually like you know the the this in its current iteration the film ends saying we're going to write their play so the next step is actually to continue and workshop this play workshop this play that's about this idea of what comes next this idea of like reparations and I think for our current moment it's really it's really important I mean it feels in some way a bit distasteful to think about what comes next when like you know currently there's like a genocide happening right now but I think imagining what our futures could be that don't repeat these kind of things is quite important so so yeah that's ideally what I would like to happen with the film um and it's nice to have these opportunities to screen uh, to screen it and like do some of the work of theatre that I think is a a really kind of um, generative generative space for imagining the future. Thank you so much. Um, we have started to have a few questions coming through, um, but please do um, email your questions to formations at ntu.ac.uk or write them in the chat if you have any further questions. So I'll start now to ask some of our um, audience questions. Um, and one of those is whether you have tried to get the blue plaques put up for the women figures you have researched and whether you think it would be possible to have those blue plaques installed on those London buildings or maybe elsewhere in the UK. I think that I haven't personally myself tried, but I think it definitely would be possible. There's de- there's campaigns, people trying to do it. Like, I think I mentioned the Una Marsa and Claudia Jones and Amy Ashwood Garvey has recently had plaques, if I remember that correctly. Um, So there are people out there who are invested in this and and are are doing it. Um, And and also quite interestingly, I recently saw that like um, a library in Camberwell, his name has been changed to the Una Marsan Library. Um, and I think someone like Una Marsan's had quite a lot of uh, attention uh, for her kind of story, her legacy recently. There was um, a BBC drama about her. So it's these things aren't kind of... Um, the Like the possibility for these histories to be engaged with differently is there um things aren't static it's it's not as if because it doesn't exist it won't ever exist thank you um i do have another question here um from um sarah from nottingham who asks 
which current artists or filmmakers are inspiring you at the moment or is there anyone who you would recommend that others look out for oof <laughs> I'm so bad <laughs> recommendation questions oh that's so terrible I, I feel really bad about this like I was actually <laughs> a friend yesterday if they could recommend people to me um what could I say about artists that I really like? <laughs> Don't worry. Maybe you maybe you'll think of some as we yeah, they'll probably occur to you as we carry on. <laughs> um, we've had a question from Tom, um, and he asks about your practice and your exhibition at Bonington. And he says that this suggests so much possibility for what you could do next. He suggests that you might write screenplays, books, more exhibitions and gallery contexts and asks what you envisage is next for you. I think that I, so, I mean, the, the kind of uh, the exciting or the thing about that I find about art is like, there's a way in which all of these things are possible. <laughs> yeah. It's quite, I, that's why I like it. Like there's lots of different ways um, that you can engage with uh, creativity. And I, I'm, continu I continue to be excited by exhibition. Um, and I think there's ideas that I have about like spatiality uh, and how to engage with space and time and choreography that I still want to pursue more. Um, but then also, yeah, this idea of making a feature film is exciting. Idea of working more with analog. There's there's lots of things that I'd be interested in doing. <laughs> um, I've had a question from one of our film and TV students at NTU who asks whether you would recommend a career in film or as a kind of artist filmmaker and whether you have any tips for current students who hope to make mm. art installations or films in future? Mm. Um, I would say, would I recommend it? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I really, like, I was a, a kid that, like, really loved the cinema and, like, it was kind of a, a place of escapism. Um, I really enjoyed that you could kind of just, like, be in a different world for a few hours. And it took me a very long time to realise that maybe this is something that I could do myself. Um, so I think that that kind of giving yourself permission, I think, is really important. And I, I think that if you'd like to do it, if you're interested and you're curious about it, you should just try, um, give it a go. And in terms of, like, tips, I think for me, what's always been... Um, what I try and do and what I still am engaged in, even though I can't remember anyone, um, is like going to see as many things as possible. Like, um, like I'm very kind of inspired by what other people do. Um, and it just like opens up possibilities. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's my tip. And also like just, I also see things as like, opportunities to experiment and try different things out um mm. and doing that with other people is always for me much more enjoyable so yeah yeah that's really interesting that's what we always tell our students as well that you have to read 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 before you can write um and we do a lot of collaborative stuff as well I think that's really interesting to think about those things to go out and experience things and to collaborate in order to create that's really interesting um, I've had a, another um, question by email, and I think this might be um, the final one that we have time for tonight. Um, this is a question about reviews of your work. Mm. Um, and they ask, um, have you had any reviews of the current installation or of the film or any other audience feedback? Or are there any other reviews of your previous work that you have found useful? Um, and how you engage with audience or review reactions to your work? It's hmm. a great question. I think that I haven't had a re reviews of this film or the exhibition at present. Unfortunately, I think it's actually quite hard to access reviews. 
Um, and I really, as I said, like conversation and dialogue is what I really desire from making work. So I would love to hear what people think. And also in some way, I'm a bit of a, um, uh, I, I kind of uh, like to punish myself, a masochist. So I really want to read the bad ones because I think it will like challenge me and help me learn more or the most. So yeah I would I'd love uh to engage more that but at the opening I lots of people talked to me and like kind of gave me feedback um which was great and in the past at screenings people in Q&A's have like commented in a way that has made me kind of change how I approach my practice or given me ideas for things to do or things not to continue doing so that having those conversations is is really important to me so I, I hope there are more opportunities to have kind of like critical feedback for my work mm. thank you that's I think that sounds like a really um refreshing and really confident approach to <laughs> to your engagement with the audience and to to reviews as well well I think this will be a good point to end at with lots for me and lots for your audience to go away and think about Thank you so much, Onyeka, for being here for Formations. And thanks to our audience online as well. And to those who'll be watching this later on the Bonnington Gallery YouTube channel. Thank you so much again for sharing so much about your practice, your research and your vision. Um, the exhibition, History is a Living Weapon in Your Hand, is on show until March the 2nd at NTU's Bonnington Gallery in Nottingham City Centre. And there is also the walkthrough event. Um, it's a really wonderful, immersive experience that takes about an hour to engage with throughout and inspires lots of re-watching and research afterwards. I'm sure there'll be lots more attendees and hopefully we can even encourage them to give you some kind of critical feedback or some reviews as well. It's highly recommended so please do visit it if you can. Thanks again Onyeka for a wonderful conversation. Thank you.